Welcome back from the coffee break, which was hopefully with a lot of coffee. Returning to our nice conversations, uh, interesting panel as you can see, pull versus push. We heard that many times before, and uh, hopefully we will give some very good and concrete answers and uh, deliver what you expect. Uh, let me introduce our three panelists today. Uh, ladies first, we have uh, Shai from Conversation Health. Shai, how are you? Very good, thank you. Clearly not Dr. John Reeves. He sends his apologies for not being able to travel this week, so you're stuck with me. Because you, actually you, you look much younger than on that picture. So, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then we have Michelle from Adorcia. Hi, Michelle, how are you? Hello, thanks for having us. Wonderful to be back Fantastic. in person. Exactly, fully agree. <laughs> and we have Marco. Bok Marko, kako je sve okay? Sve je super, hvala. Okay, since the majority is Croatian Serbia, we can speak then on Croatian Serbian. I hope that's not a problem for the audience and... Uh, no, no, just kidding, right. So, uh, Shai, you prepared an interesting presentation for us, so thank let's you. kick off the stage. Well, thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Uh, keep dropping in after the coffee break. I'm delighted to be on stage with Michelle and Marco, and we will get to the questions that Dario has for us shortly. But I just wanted to frame over the next couple of minutes why customer experience and pull communications with push communications are so important for us today. There's a great quote from IBM that says that the last best experience that you had when it comes to customer service becomes your expectation everywhere else. Now, within healthcare, when you think of our physicians, our patients, our stakeholders, that's exactly the same for them too. But what are we talking about? We're in an era of convenience. I, you, everybody else wants things quickly, they want them easily, any time of day, any channel of choice, and they want that product and service to be top quality. Put that into healthcare context, again, it's no different for all of us when we're thinking about our communication channels and strategies. Now, pharma needs to think about a couple of things, and all of us as communicators in this room and your colleagues and organizations. Do we really understand what our customers want when it comes to customer experience and engagement versus what it is that we're actually doing in order to drive engagement and delivery of our tools and services? Now, the pandemic has obviously changed things a little bit for us, and digitize and push is probably the quickest way to summarize the last two years for all of us. A need to stay relevant and in front of our customers in the absence of face-to-face. -face. But have we delivered that customer experience, or have we created frustration and lost value because we're not timing our delivery appropriately? So how can we start to enable pull as a means by which we as healthcare professionals, patients, providers, can get in touch with our businesses and our brands at moments of need. Now, AI has upped the ante for us to be able to start to think about customer behavior and customer change. Medical, commercial, clinical, your organizations are looking at how AI can support your businesses to transform. And in the context of conversation and pull communications, AI-powered virtual assistants and conversational tools are starting to become a means by which we enable that push-pull dynamic. Now, the AI that we think about in the context of push and pull has become a lot more sophisticated. Chatbots, as you probably know them, are no longer the standard that our industry is going to accept. We need to think about AI-powered solutions that are making the most of natural language processing and understanding for medical language. We need to think about configurations for safety management AE and PC reporting and audit purposes. And we need to think about integration into all of those existing tech stacks. This is enterprise level technology, organizational change. We need to be facilitating that end to end. Now we've had a number of conversations with senior executives across organizations and there is concern. There is hesitancy about how you bring these capabilities into the business. What is the role of our humans? Do we need to be concerned about jobs? What does it mean from cost and investment? The harsh reality for all of us is that continuing to hire humans alone is simply not sustainable. The quality, the value, the experience, absolutely we want to harness from our humans, but doing it through headcount alone when we think of reach, frequency, geography, labels, and language is not going to be a model of engagement we can sustain, particularly when it comes back to customer experience. AI-powered virtual assistants start to become part of the solution 
that needs to be considered within those strategies. So maybe we need to stop thinking about humans versus AI, and we start thinking about humans alongside AI, and reframe what that team dynamic looks like in order to be able to deliver that self-service model, that era of convenience, being able to get what I need, when I need it, how I want it, but never forgetting the fact that the human is still there to provide their value and their experience. We'll let technology do what it does best, automate, repeatability, consistency, and delivery through intuitive channels and intuitive interfaces, and we'll let our humans do what they're good at. Highly strategic, business-changing information in exchange, and crucially, relationship management and development. Now, many of you in this room have worked on bringing enterprise change into the organization, and it's tough. Our industry requires a lot of stakeholders at the table to ensure that compliance is met at every turn. But we're talking customer experience, remember? Think about your other verticals, your daily lives. Experience matters, and we need to find a way to bring the two together. We want to be designing experiences that mean that people come back time and again. They refer us across that healthcare service. And again, we're thinking about the use of technology cleverly alongside our humans. So we have a business need. We have a customer demand. We have the technology that is growing in terms of sophistication. Where do we begin? Well, as with every technology at an enterprise level, it starts with a business case, it starts with a vision, and it starts with a plan. We want to avoid one-hit wonder syndrome. We don't want to be building solutions that find uh, the, the light of day for a year and then die in a corner. This is about organizational transformation, and the, the gentleman in the first panel talked about it quite strongly. We need to plan our resources, our time, our investment to ensure that we are keeping these services up to date with the changing behaviors of our customers. And we need to listen to the data. That data informs how we improve that experience, how we continue to optimize and refine, and crucially in the context of Omnichannel, how that data actually informs the use of all of our other channels when it comes to that end-to-end -end experience. Many of you in this room are on your conversational journeys already. Some of you might be thinking about starting it, and I'm thrilled to hear from Michelle and Marco as to what they think about when it comes to starting to implement those solutions. Thank you, Shai. Certainly very interesting insights, and thank you for setting the stage. So let's deep dive into the discussion. Uh, first question, which we prepared during our preparation calls and which we thought will be quite interesting for the audience is, uh, what are the key components of a great customer experience in digital first engagement? Let's start with you, Michelle. Yeah, from my perspective, um, building from a medical affairs, medical information perspective, I really believe that thinking like the customer and not just thinking about what we want to offer them is really critical. So ask the customer. Ask the customer, like was talked about actually in the earlier session, um, but also learn from your channels you have. Don't be afraid to talk with the customer. But I think you know, what it really comes down to, once you started thinking about the fact that they've been very digital now, they're very engaged with us in pharma, much more than they ever were before, thanks to the you know, pandemic and wanting to know more about the medicines and vaccines, and now they want to know everything. Um, you know, it really comes down to thinking what they actually need and want, and for me, I think one of the key learnings has been to work cross-functionally. So not just to think about medical, but when someone comes in, whether they're an HCP or a patient, they might be interested in your clinical trials. They might be interested in your medications. They might be interested in doing studies with you. There's so many different things that a customer thinks about when they come in. So what are they coming to your business to look for? And how can you make that a seamless experience? And you know, it comes down to when you are going to go with this kind of digital first approach, you think like the customer, and then you make sure you have really good content. And the content always matters. We always forget that bit. We go, oh, it's AI, it's shiny, it's new. But the reality of it is the content still is the king. Thanks. So that's my major learning so far. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Yeah. Marco. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. And I would actually agree uh, with your opening note about uh, the last experience is actually shaping the, your expectation of the next experience. And coming from the GSK, consumer healthcare, our goal is actually to deliver everyday health with humanity. And guess what? We realized our customers and consumers are, surprise, surprise, humans as well. <laughs> are and you sure? We are almost sure. <laughs> <laughs> and actually what we also started thinking about is actually that they're not comparing the experience they're having with us, 
uh, with experience they're having with our competitors in the pharma and consumer healthcare industries, but actually comparing the experience with uh, Uber or Airbnb or that restaurant that they booked a table last night and the service they got in the same restaurant. So we invested a lot of uh, time and, ma and money and uh, resources actually in talking to our consumers and customers to understand what is this that they need. And we came up with actually three components of the best-in-class consumer experience, how they would talk, how they would expect from the GSK consumer healthcare. And it's all about the speed, channels, and the quality of interactions they're having with us. So in terms of the speed, it's uh, informed the consumer's expectations of the speed is actually informed by the complexity of the question they have uh, asking us. So for the more complex questions, they would probably expect a week or two weeks answer, but the simple questions, they would expect instantaneous answer. Then uh, in terms of the channels, obviously how much emotionally connected they are to the problem they're having, and also the urgency that they have to solve that problem also informs the choice of their channel. And finally, the, the, I would just speed up because of the time, but finally about the quality of interaction they're having, what we learned is judge the quality of interaction in the eyes of consumers and, expert and um, uh, customers is actually judged by the perceived effort they're investing to get to the answer. And it can be the perceived effort but they're talking to our real agent or the digital agent, but also the channel hoppings, how many times they need to hop between the channels or how many clicks they need to do in order to get the answer. So definitely the speed channels and the quality of interactions is informing our digital strategy. So just to align, you're treating your customers like you would like to be treated as yourself as a customer. Absolutely. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Rocket science. Okay. Second question, uh, what role do virtual assistants play uh, for pharma in the whole omni-channel and uh, change management strategies? Uh, let's start with you, Marco. Yeah, absolutely. So I think also talking about, like kind of building on the, the last question, I mean, the customers and consumers are, all, are humans as well. And what they expect is actually that instantaneous answer, immediate answer. And the moment when they actually get in touch with us, it's already too late because they're investing their time and, in their eyes, wasting their time talking to us. So they would rather probably talk to their friends and families rather than talking to us. And I was surprised uh, a few weeks ago, I actually read a research, probably a couple of years long, that apparently 37% of Americans would rather go to the dentist, spend the time with the dentist, than actually contact the customer care. It really surprised me a lot. Yeah. So from, from that perspective, I think the, we, we, need to, we need to ensure actually, and I'm referring back uh, to my notes, that we, as a, as a customer service leaders, we need to ensure that uh, smooth and effortless interaction with the consumers and using the digital, the digital agents, the um, FAQs, uh, and also the, the chatbots and any other digital services actually to enable the, the, the smooth interactions and getting the answers faster in the 24-7 manner to the, to the customers. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. Michelle? Yeah, I think for me, you know, um, you know, I'm looking often at maintaining contact centers, whether they're for patients or they're commercially focused or they're medically focused, even patient support programs which with call centers. And the reality of it is we don't have the luxury of constantly adding human capital to that. We really have to have something that gives us a greater reach. And the virtual assistant, I think, is something that, you know, again, picking the right types of, you know, inquiries and, and content that should go there really makes a lot of sense um, because then someone can self-serve that 24-7, 365. Um, and if you have a great customer service, which many of us do in our, you know, our contact center teams, they still can't do everything. I mean, we think about our colleague that spoke from BioNTech. I mean, no one, I mean, we would expect we'd have a lot of inquiries, but the amounts that they saw were just exponentially beyond what we could ever possibly be able to work with. So, you know, the virtual assistant, both on the, the web space but as well, I think, you know, I know pharma, uh, some pharma companies use particularly like the voice AI capabilities on their phone lines. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're very, very um, important then to basically take away that pressure from those customer service teams and allow them to focus on the really critical high touch types of inquiries and to have the best possible experience with your company. Thank you. Shai, anything to add? Coming yeah. from a solution vendor and uh, dealing with many different uh, pharma customers, right? Yeah, I think, I think both Marco and Michelle have summarized it really well across medical and commercial, and each of those departments at the moment is facing different challenges post-pandemic, and, and medical, as you say, that volume of inquiries coupled with coverage, very challenging. How can you bring technology in? And 
I pick up on something David Dijk said in his uh, panel session earlier that some companies have no MSLs and, and no reps, but your customers still want to be able to talk to those folk. They, they still see them as being gateways to credible, trustworthy information. They sit on tools and services that represent the brands and the businesses. So we still need to find a way to deliver that capability, maybe not in the way that we did it. So I think it is looking by vertical at where and how the technology is going to deal with these business challenges that are being faced. Thank you, Shai. Let's move to the next question, which is uh, when looking to deploy conversational AI, uh, what does good look like? I mean, what's the benchmark? What's the standard? And let's start with you, Marco. Yeah, of course. So first of all, in the GSK, we're probably not yet there where, where I would like us to be in terms of uh, deploying and using the AI in the conversation with, uh, uh, with the consumers and the customers. But definitely some of the areas that we think about when uh, deciding to deploy those conversational AIs is actually, first of all, learning about our past experiences with the consumers and customers, what type of inquiries and what type of questions they're having, and being very cl crystal clear in terms of what are the type of engagements we want to automate versus type of engagements that we still want to have that human touch, one-to-one -one phone conversations with the consumers. Then second, we are looking into the like a CSAT, NPS, NES scores to understand what is the expectations of the customers and consumers when they're interacting with us for those specific questions so that we can manage their expectations when deploying the, the conversational chatbots or any other uh, solutions. And then I guess third and the probably most important thing is uh, to, to ensure that, that we implement the continuous learning loops and the continuous measurement loops so that we can learn on the mistakes and we can ensure that we are measuring what matters the most so that there is that continuous improvement element because we cannot do it first time right. Certainly, yeah. certainly. Thank you, Marco. Michelle? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, we're on the journey in my new company to actually get back to um, deploying conversational AI. And I would say what I learned from my past experience of doing this um, is, first and foremost, the content still matters. And having a lot of content, if you're not going to have to ramp up as quickly as some of our colleagues mentioned earlier to something within a few months, and you have time to actually do this mindfully, you really have to have a lot of content. You have to have a lot of information because you need to feed the beast, as we say. You really need to the give hungry machine. the hungry <laughs> machine learning. Um, it really needs a lot of information and a lot of data so that it becomes, it's able to learn and it's able to recognize the things that you need it to. And you have time with tagging and spending, a, you have to really spend a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to spend a lot of time, in fact, doing that work with tagging and getting that content so that it's ready, but also that the AI and the algorithm is able to constantly you know, interact as you would expect it to. You're actually giving it the knowledge to be able to interact in a very human way. Um, there's some personas that you know, I've seen that you know, can even make jokes with a customer. Do you know a good one? No. <laughs> I, think, I think Anna, the chatbot I met before, she was funnier than me. Um, and, uh, and I mean, but it takes time, right? I mean, humor is really a very high level um, of knowledge. And so, again, that takes time to do that. And so, you know, if you have the time to be able to do this, take the time, get the content, and really make sure that you do a good job in getting that in there. Because it will only mean an even better experience for the customer. Shy, anything to add? And maybe a good joke from a, from a chat. <laughs> <laughs> no, you definitely want a joke from me. Um, three things, I guess, I'd say, and I touched on a couple of them, just looking at how we've, we, we've partnered across the industry over the last four or five years and just where success has started to come from. I think first and foremost is that vision. To, to Michelle's point, it is a plan because it is a journey. It's not going to be a one-hit wonder, as I said earlier, where you're one and done in a year. This needs short, medium, long-term goals and objectives. And with that comes a really strong project advocacy owner internally. I think those champions internally who are prepared to bring the stakeholders on board, um, explain the value benefit to both the customers and to the business, because there has to be a business gain here too, are the ones that are going to deliver over the long term. The second thing is change management. It's been mentioned a number of times already this morning. You know, we are talking about technology alongside humans. Humans need to feel reassured, comfortable, and also actually understand that there might be changes to how they do their jobs as a result of this technology giving them insight into their customers. 
And the final thing I'd probably say, which is a little bit in its infancy, is a data strategy. I think these solutions really will benefit from strong data strategy, both for the solution itself, but also within that omni-channel. How do I actually use what I'm learning to better inform our end-to-end? -end? Thank you, Shai. And last question, uh, if you get it right, hopefully one day, what's the size of opportunity for medical and commercial teams? Maybe, Michelle, you can speak from the medical side. Yeah, from the medical side, um, I think that it really actually is an endless opportunity. Um, and many of us are getting bigger and bigger in our remit within our organizations, whether you're supporting medical affairs um, or maybe even commercial teams or patient support. There's many different aspects to what we do. And again, like I've said already, you can't constantly just keep layering on more people. You have to have a good digital presence. You have to make it possible that you know, the customer can interact with you in the way that they want to. They've changed their behaviors in the last two years. All of us have. We all are working differently online, and we're, we have different expectations. Um, but for me, the, the, the opportunity is endless, but you have to plan for it as well. Um, you know, Shai's touched on this many times. You really have to think about what you want to accomplish in this space. Um, and ultimately, you want to make sure that you're monitoring that and constantly seeing the feedback and how the engagement is actually, you know, how the customer is actually using your, your assets and working with the chatbots particularly. When are, when are they getting stuck? You know, how are, how are they actually, you know, interacting and, and are they having success from these net promoter scores? Um, we get inundated with data when we launch these things and we don't spend en enough time looking at it. So I really recommend you really need to make sure you have someone looking at this because you need to constantly improve this and it's a constant process. Thank you, Michelle. Marco, from Thank the commercial you. side. Yeah, from the commercial side, I guess there is a general misconception in the industry that uh, the customer care departments are actually there to wow the consumers and customers, but actually on, on opposite, again, the research actually shows that if someone contacts a customer care, they're four times more likely to be disloyal to the brand and to the product that actually be loyal. So I think if we, if we get it right, we're actually going to, to impact that, uh, the, making it smaller, this loyalty, uh, the, the impact, the negative impact on the, on the loyalty of the customers by enabling that 24-7 presence in the channel customers and consumers want, but also to the speed of answer that they expect from us. And second of all, we're going to free up the agents actually to spend even longer time on the phone and on the other synchronous channels with the customers and consumers that actually have a specific need to, to interact on a longer time. So the average handling time is growing, but even though it's growing, actually the cost per resolution is shrinking down because you're doing a lot of self-serve. And finally, by implementing the, this type of solutions is actually helping us to have a structured way to learn more about the customers. Thank you, Marco. Shai, anything to add? I think Michelle and Marco said everything very, very well. Fantastic. We are left with a couple of minutes and uh, any questions from the audience? So now you can ask because I think the topic is certainly very relevant. Okay, we have a question. Questions are free, actually, so you can <laughs> ask. <laughs> Hello, uh, Philippe Kirby from MSD. Uh, a question that probably the elephant in the room is medical legal reviews and compliance. Any thoughts on how you deal with that when you're trying to implement a, a conversational AI? Yeah, I, I will gladly take this. Because um, <laughs> usually I'm the police as well. So uh, um, now my biggest advice is involve them at the beginning, involve them throughout the process. Um, also educate them. The channel isn't what is the concern with compliance. It's still the content. And I think we lose sight of this. We go chatbot and everyone gets nervous or we get AI and people get nervous. It still comes down to what's the information you're sharing. Mm -hmm. That's just how they're going to access it. But you have to educate that with your stakeholders, but you have to involve them early. Do not drop it on their heads like the wicked witch in the house in the movie The Wizard of Oz. Because they won't be your friends and they will absolutely shut it down and they'll end up actually pulling out bits that were really critical to the customer experience if you don't manage them well. Any further questions? Please. The microphone is coming, so. Yes, it came. Hi. Um, so when you think around the experiences you've had um, and the hurdles you'd had to overcome to really make this a success story, 
Could you give an example of, of the one that you remember the best and maybe situationally sort of what did you have to deal with to really get this through your organization? If I, if I understand the question correctly, so you want to, understand, you want to learn about a specific example when we, when we got it right. Well, actually we do in, uh, in our department, actually what we do, we, we listen a lot to the calls or read the emails or read about the engagements we're having with consumers. And actually the, the case that recently we were sharing across the company was a mother actually from India who was having a opened Panadol for a very long time on, the, on their house shelf. Uh, like few months and actually the, the kid was with a temperature, with a high temperature, so she was calling our department actually to say, I don't know, I don't know what is the, the, the shelf life of the open Panadol, so can I still, uh, can I still give the, the Panadol to my kid? She, she's having like a 40 degrees temperature. So in that moment when we were able to help in the moment on the phone channel, that, that is the success. That's why we do our business, really. I think for AI, for us, when it's been the most successful, is when the information is particularly bite-sized and high volume. So things like uh, temperature excursions, I've dealt with vaccines, I've dealt with cold chain products. These clog up your phone lines, these pick up your channels very significantly. Um, I think you have to look at your, your metrics and see, is the topic of high volumes topics that can be answered simply? And that's usually your cold chain, your storage, your kind of you know, shelf life questions basic packaging questions, there's definitely things that fall easily into that bucket um, of appropriate, you know, content. And if you use that as the baseline for some of your self, you know, interactive for MedInfo type questions, that's very helpful. I think on the other side is you also have to understand and anticipate what kind of content someone's going to need. So if you have a vaccine, for example, you're going to need a user guide in some cases, maybe a quick adverse event summary so they know what to expect. It might be, you know, how are they going to, uh, you know, inject something with a user guide. You have to think about all these things that you might even put out anyway in patient support networks or that you might give a sales rep to offer to a clinician. Those are the things that are ideal and are successful in my experience um, in the self-serve and chatbot environment because it's easy to tag it and it's high volume and it's low value, in fact, to like the need for a high touch interaction. Mm. And the only other thing I'd probably add to that just from a, a service capability is ensuring that there is time and investment on traffic drivers. Just because you build it doesn't mean anyone's going to use it. The yeah. same with phone lines, websites, and every other channel that we have out there. We need to educate both internally and externally that the service is there. And again, value benefit. Why should you come here versus your traditional model of maybe emailing or phone call? What are you going to get out of it? And how can I help you? And then it's about ensuring that when they do hit that touch point, Credibility, accessibility, intuitive, easy, all those things that we're up against with Google, we're able to hit and surpass because the quality of the information and the tools is that much higher coming from us as our brands. Thank you, Shai. Thanks for the questions. Uh, maybe we can take a joke so that we show that humans are better <laughs> than a machine. Anyone with a joke, yeah? <laughs> okay, we can accept a question. <laughs> with a joke. <laughs> Um, so, reverse of that question, can you share any clear examples of something that totally failed and like do, you would not do it again and you highly recommend us not to do it as well? Because I know we talk about successes a lot, what's working, but do you have any clear tangible examples of this did not work at all, don't do it? I can say very quickly if you I was like. about yeah. to jump as well. <laughs> go, go ahead, you go first. I went first last time too. I think we, in the, in the GSK, consumer healthcare, actually, we tried implementing a, a chatbot and we, we failed on a very simple example, actually. We forgot thinking about humans. So we were so proud that we implemented a chatbot on one particular website in a particular country. We kept it very simple and small, but actually we forgot that what about if the chatbot cannot answer all the questions? We didn't ensure that smooth transition from the chatbot to the live agent, and it was a clear failure, and we got it very badly in the yeah. CISAS course. <laughs> yeah. We've all done that, if it's uh, any <laughs> consolation. Um, I would say the time I've seen this fail the most, even digital in general, is when you're going, what do we need to get out to the customers and push to them? And if that's all you're thinking about, you're not gonna get people to your site. They might visit once by accident, or they might visit because they talk to your rep, but they're not gonna go back there. They're not gonna be wowed by it because you're messaging to them. And at the end of the day, we understand we have to get information to people, and there's certain things that we want them to make sure they really understand about our products. 
But the reality of it is, if you go out there and just offer what you think that they want without any, t like any sort of touch on you know, the reality of the, doing the market research, talking with the key opinion leaders, you're just, you're just gonna fail. It's, it's, I've seen it time and time again, and especially with a chat bot. If you have stuff there that is not what you really are in the shoes of a customer, they are not gonna be able to find it, and they're not gonna come back. Advice number one, ask them. Exactly. Yeah. Ask them, what do they need? Why yeah. would they come here? Ask your yeah. chat bot. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Good, so thanks a lot for this thank great you. panel. It was a great conversation. We see it from the questions from the audience. So thank you very much, and uh, let's hear the next one. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.